Hey, it's Stephanie. We've talked a lot recently about our challenging economic climate amid record inflation and higher interest rates. And for some, that has meant taking on more debt. And it's not just credit cards that people may turn to. Increasingly, consumers are being offered a new kind of installment plan, buy now, pay later. This week, we're revisiting an episode from last year on why this payment option has increased tenfold in recent years. Here's the episode. Hope you enjoy. You know, it's a powder keg, right? A product which was intended to help people learn responsible credit has, in fact, put credit in the hands of people in a pretty dangerous way. Welcome to the Best New Ideas in Money, a podcast from MarketWatch. I'm Stephanie Kelton. I'm an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. And I'm Charles Passy, a reporter at MarketWatch. Each week, we explore innovations in economics, finance, technology, and policy that rethink the way we live, work, spend, save, and invest. Stephanie, what was the last thing you bought online? The last thing I bought online? Um, oh, I know what it was. It, it was a 40-pound bag of deer food. I can't compete with that. For me, it was three shirts. But what I actually want to know is if you've noticed more and more a new option when you're checking out. The question of whether you'd like a different payment option, one that divides the full amount into just four monthly payments or so. It's called Buy Now, Pay Later. Buy Now, Pay Later companies are basically the kind of sweet spot between the instant gratification that you would get from making a credit card purchase with some of the features that we saw in layaway programs that existed decades ago. That's Carlton English. She's a reporter for Barron's and covers banks and fintechs. And one of the biggest new financial technologies over the past few years is Buy Now, Pay Later, known as BNPL. The term itself is pretty self-explanatory, but in practical terms, it works something like this. Say you want to buy a new computer. When you're at the point of sale, you know, making that payment, whether it's online or perhaps even in store, you make an agreement to put one down payment down, usually about a quarter of the price, with an agreement to make the other three or so remaining payments over a period that's typically about six weeks to maybe about three months. Buy Now, Pay Later initially became popular in Australia and New Zealand, but it's since gone global, and it's projected to get even bigger. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau has identified Affirm, Afterpay, Klarna, PayPal, and SIP as the five major providers offering this financing option. But it's still growing. By 2025, it's projected to account for $680 billion, or 12% of online sales of goods. One of its major draws? Buy Now, Pay Later programs often offer 0% financing, and that's why they've become so popular, because it kind of gives shoppers a bit of clarity. You know you're buying a laptop, say it's for $1,000. You know it's going to be four payments. You know it's going to be paid off in about two months or so. Whereas with a credit card, maybe you have a $5,000 limit on your credit card. For many people, part of the appeal of Buy Now, Pay Later is that it's not a credit card. A study of consumer rationale for using BNPL found that 39% of users turned to the product in order to avoid credit card interest. Dislike using credit cards, can't get approved for credit cards, and credit cards maxed out, all featured as other reasons. Some of the other motives listed hinted at the consumers who might find themselves drawn to Buy Now, Pay Later not having a bank account, being able to borrow without a credit check, and making purchases outside of their budget made up the rest of the list. So the popularity of buy now, pay later goes well beyond just not wanting to use a credit card. Where that popularity concentrates, among younger consumers, those with less access to traditional lines of credit, and those with worse credit ratings, represents a potential harm to these consumers as this new financial product takes off. As we'll explore later in the episode, a number of factors from the increase in online shopping to the psychology of payments have all contributed to the explosion of the technology. And when I say explosion, I mean explosion. Last year, the five major BNPL lenders originated 180 million loans to the tune of $24.2 billion. 
From 2019 to 2021, both the quantity of loans overall and the size of the loans have increased by over 200%. Using a new technology might also be exciting for some customers, but when it comes to buy now, pay later, it really only feels new. The concept of installment payments has been around for a very long time. From the days that people were buying refrigerators or washing machines at Sears, they would pay in installments. That's Marshall Lux. He's a longtime financial services consultant and executive, and a fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School who published a paper on BNPL in the spring. He says that although the technology and current ubiquity of offerings at checkout is new, this type of financing is anything but. Back in the 60s, American Express and American Airlines partnered on Sign and Fly, which offered point-of-sale financing for airline flights. Point-of-sale financing means options other than paying all in one go at checkout. Services like layaway go back even further, all the way to the Great Depression. When you put an item on layaway, you make a down payment and return to the store to make periodic installments before finally taking it home when it's paid off. During the 1980s, the rise in credit cards initially threatened layaway, but it's still widely available today. And as Carlton English points out, buy now, pay later offers a distinct advantage. You get the instant gratification where you actually can take the product home with you or order it and have it shipped to you right away. Whereas with the layaway product, the old way was you were going into the store every two weeks and looking at the computer and putting down, you know, another payment on it, leaving, coming back in a week or two, putting down the payment. You weren't getting to possess the item until you actually completed all of your payments. There's also an incentive for businesses. Since they aren't charging interest and the late fees are typically fairly low, buy now, pay later companies make money by charging retailers for using their service typically about four to just under 10%. That may seem like it would be bad for the businesses using BNPL, but because it attracts customers, it's bringing in more sales. Last year, a study found that buy now, pay later increases conversion rates by 20 to 30%. By conversion rate, we mean people who go from browsing to actually buying. There's been a major increase in the use of buy now, pay later over the past few years. From 2019 to last year, for the five major BNPL providers, the number of loans in the U.S. increased by 970 percent. The rise in e-commerce spurred on by the pandemic was a big part of that. Online sales were up about 20 percent in 2020. BNPL became especially attractive when COVID-19 hit. You had a lot of people shopping online. And even though we had economic stimulus from the government, the $600 checks, the extended unemployment benefits, you still had people dealing with a lot of economic uncertainty. So the comfort of being able to spread out payments over a longer period of time, just to hold on to cash in a time of uncertainty, I think was important. But there are forces beyond the pandemic at work. The psychology behind how and why we pay the way we do plays a big role in why options like buy now, pay later are so attractive. People seem to behave quite differently when spending with those different types of payment methods. Now the question is, why is that? That's Merle Vandenacker. She's a behavioral scientist who studied how people manage their money through different payment methods. She says to understand why BNPL is on the rise, it can be helpful to look closer at a theory called the pain of paying. I can't say I like the sound of that. Me either, but here it goes. The term goes all the way back to 1996 and comes from Ofer Zellemeyer, whose philosophy dissertation had the same title. His research looked at the negative feelings people had during a purchase. What Zellemeyer found was that the more difficult the purchase, the less a person wanted to go through with the transaction. And when it came to preferred payment methods, there was a clear winner. So obviously paying with cash is not that easy. You have to go through the entire process of getting the right denomination out whilst you're at the checkout. And then you rummage through your coins. Now, if you do this with a credit card, it's one tap or one swipe and that, that's the transaction done. That is it. In other words, paying with a card took away the pain. The entire transaction is essentially painless. And that is because there's no limited amount of resources. You just need to have the card available. You don't really get a lot of exposure to the value that you are losing. 
And at the same time, and this is a big one for credit card, is the cost of whatever you're purchasing isn't actually incurred at that very moment. So the loss of resources happens whenever you're actually repaying the credit card statement. Vandenacker says that a lot of payment methods have been designed to make it easier for consumers, but they're really just deferring the pain and making it even more acute down the line. You tap, you walk out with whatever you've just purchased, assuming that you are in a physical store, and that is it. And it is such a quick process that the brain barely has any time to register that you've just lost resources. And the further you can disentangle this idea of, I've just obtained a good or service versus I have had to pay for this good or service, the more people are likely to spend because it is quick and it is easy. And as a result, it's also very forgettable, which makes that some people think they have certain resources left. For example, they thought they had another thousand dollars in their bank account. However, because they've had a couple more transactions, which were very easy, very quick, and as a result, very forgettable, they've actually only had eight hundred dollars left in their bank account but they're still acting as if they had a thousand. So what we see is that a lot of people, they spend more frequently, they spend more, and as a result, very often can also just get into debt because they don't sufficiently update what they still have in their actual bank balance rather than the bank balance that they run in their head, <laughs> which uh, these two things tend to be very different quite often. Despite the distinction between buy now, pay later products and credit cards, Vandenacker says that from a behavioral economic standpoint, BNPL isn't that different. Psychologically, this is not a painful method to use because what we're doing is we're giving you all the reward, all the pleasure up front, as in you can buy the good or service immediately, you can have all that enjoyment and none of the pain of actually having to figure out how to pay for it and where the money is going to come from. And then of course, also the immediate loss of resources. So we're disentangling those completely. It's even easier to see how that can happen with buy now, pay later. When you make your first payment, you know what it's for. Then let's say two weeks later, another payment reminder comes in. You might be a little confused for a second, then think, oh yeah, I do owe that. And by the time you make the next payment, you're like, I have no idea what this is for. Like, you have no association between the costs that you're now incurring versus the pleasure that you originally had from the purchase. This is completely decoupled. And because the original purchase wasn't super salient, because there was no pain of paying, it is very difficult for memory to actually retrieve what this money is associated with. And this is especially true if the thing that you bought or the service that you purchased was an impulse buy. And you were like, yes, I want it. Not I need it, not like I've been thinking about this a long time. No, just I want it now. And as a result, down the line, when you're incurring the cost for the product, all the pain is experienced then without the actual association of what you're repaying. And that's uh, psychologically, that, that's very problematic. And it might not just be psychologically problematic. Coming up, what does the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau have to say about buy now, pay later? That's after the break. Welcome back to the best new ideas in money. Before the break, we learned about the origins of buy now, pay later, how it works and why psychologically it appeals to us as consumers. But just about every technological innovation also comes with a potential threat that the new service or product will cause more harm than good. And when it comes to buy now, pay later, that's something the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, has recently been exploring. The buy now, pay later stocks taking a hit today. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau opening an inquiry into some of these names. The CFPB Director Chopra saying buy now, pay later is a new version of the old layaway plan, but with modern, faster twists where the consumer gets a product immediately but gets the debt immediately too. At the end of last year, the CFPB issued market monitoring orders to the five major buy now, pay later lenders ordering Affirm, Afterpay, Klarna, PayPal, and Zip to submit information so the CFPB could assess industry practices and risks to consumers. This September, the CFPB released a report based on that data it collected. 
It breaks down important metrics like who is using BNPL, what they're using it for, and how borrowers fared when repaying their loans. The highlights of the CFPB report is that this is a rapidly growing market. It is expanding in leaps and bounds. That's Lauren Saunders. She's the associate director of the National Consumer Law Center, a nonprofit focusing on marketplace justice for low-income consumers. As for who is behind that rapid expansion, the CFPB report found that roughly half of all borrowers were 33 and under, with 18 to 24-year-olds accounting for about 17% of borrowers last year, and 25 to 33-year-olds accounting for about 33%. Here's Barron's reporter Carlton English again. Buy Now, Pay Later is pretty popular with millennial and Gen Z consumers. A few reasons for that. One, people who are maybe at the start of their careers who they may need to buy things. They're moving into new apartments. They're starting new jobs. So, you know, they're buying things at a time when they're just, you know, starting out in their careers and maybe don't have a lot of disposable income. It provides an option for things like that. And that explains why it's popular for that cohort. Also explains why there's some fears about the popularity. You know, the first thing I did was I called my kids and said, I hope you're not using this thing. And they're not. But you know what? There are plenty of kids who are using this thing. That's Marshall Lux, the Harvard fellow who wrote a working paper on BNPLs earlier this year. He says the relative youth of these customers is something to be wary of, especially amid near record inflation. People are finding it difficult to buy things. You know, it's a powder keg, right? A product which was intended to help people learn responsible credit has, in fact, put credit in the hands of people in a pretty dangerous way. We reached out to the Financial Technology Association, a group that represents Afterpay, Klarna, PayPal, and Zip, for comment on whether BNPL technologies were putting credit into the hands of consumers without sufficient vetting. A representative for the FTA said, quote, Buy Now, Pay Later empowers consumers to manage their finances better and make small dollar short term purchases without incurring high fees or interest. They pointed out that unlike credit cards, BNPL initially, quote, extends credit based on a single transaction, typically less than $250, and assesses the status of repayments before approving future purchases. These features make it more difficult to rack up a lot of debt. But critics like Lux point to another piece of the CFPB report as concerning what categories people are spending in. Apparel and beauty has long been the category with the majority of consumers, accounting for almost two-thirds of purchases in 2019. But according to the new data, a worrying category has surged over time, what the CFPB calls every day. Here's Lauren Saunders. One of the most alarming places where it's growing is everyday use for gas and groceries and necessities and things that you have to buy every week and certainly every month. So if you can't afford to buy your groceries this week and you put off part of the expense the next week, but then you've got to buy more groceries next week, that's a problem. And that's an indication of it being used in a potentially unaffordable way. Marshall Lux agrees. As a former risk manager, when people start stretching to buy groceries, it is a huge problem. The report also looked into how BNPL providers assess creditworthiness. They used what's called a soft pull, which shows the same type of information that comes up when you apply for a loan or more credit. Your loans, payment history, any public records or collections, but it doesn't ding your credit like the hard pull does. Soft pulls typically happen when you check your own credit report or if you're being pre-screened. When it comes to BNPL, the credit approval rate was 73% last year. But some of the borrowers are struggling. The report found that over 10% were charged at least one late fee last year, which can vary in terms and amounts from company to company. And when it comes to how decisions on creditworthiness are being made, it's still a bit of a puzzle. The CFPB, in its report, said they did not ask and did not test their algorithms which means that we don't understand what models they use. And we don't understand what data they're using. If you compare that to credit cards or other financial products, that's a big difference. This is an unregulated part of financial services. So financial service 
companies would have their models looked at, right? Because they know that regulators will ask. These are not being tested in that way. And that's perhaps the big takeaway from the report. That kind of regulation is coming. Now, it's not to say there are no regulations when it comes to buy now, pay later companies. The Financial Technology Association points out that all BNPL products follow consumer protection laws and regulations, including anti-money laundering, fair lending, credit reporting, debt collection, privacy, treatment, and electronic fund transfers. But the change that is on the way is more regulation. The CFPB said it will begin the process of issuing specific rules for buy now, pay later, similar to the ones that credit card companies follow, based on what it found in its report. The agency will also issue guidance on data and developing credit reporting practices. For Lauren Saunders of the National Consumer Law Center, regulation would be welcome. We need regulation. We need clear rules that apply to everybody so everybody knows that the products are safe and they know what their rights are. And really, buy now, pay later is just a form of credit card. It's a form of credit that you use to buy goods and services. And the legal protections we have for credit cards are really exactly what we need for buy now, pay later. We need lenders to ensure that the borrower can afford to repay the loan. We need chargeback protections if you don't get what you paid for. If there are any late fees, they should be reasonable. And you need statements that collect all of your purchases in one place. So we think that it would work quite well to apply credit card rules to buy now, pay later. And we cannot count on voluntary policies and a mismatch of fine print that you know, tells you different things from different buy now, pay later providers. Some of the BNPL companies also seem to be in favor of regulation. After the release of the report, a firm issued a statement saying it was, quote, encouraged by the CFPB's conclusions following their review. A representative for the Financial Technology Association said the report confirmed buy now, pay later is a competitive alternative to other credit products and that it would, quote, continue working with regulators like the CFPB to advance positive consumer outcomes. Here's Marshall Lux again. The good news is that a lot of these folks, one, kind of got the joke which is that regulation is coming and they better self-regulate. And so the changes that they'll need to make are not going to be a surprise for hopefully many of them. Lux says he worries about the speed of any potential changes. Or in other words, we may be looking at more of a tortoise than a hare. Government moves slowly and technology moves quickly. And one of my concerns is they did this report, there'll be, I suspect, a comment period. Then we're gonna have an election. Elections have consequences. This is not an issue that is so top of mind relative to crypto, relative to a lot of other things, ESG. So I think it's got a little bit of a backseat but Lauren Saunders says as a first step, applying the credit card rules could happen relatively quickly. In order to apply the credit card rules to buy now, pay later products, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau needs to issue guidance clarifying that these are a form of credit card. Now, that wouldn't take that long to do, you know, potentially within the next year. Applying supervision to buy now, pay later requires some process, some rulemaking, but that also wouldn't, wouldn't take that long. While we wait for that regulation to come, if you find yourself wondering about the best way to pay for something, Merle Vandenacker has this advice. Remember the pain of paying. I understand why. People want convenience, people want ease. And I think if a company, uh, most likely in this case, a fintech or a neobank, if you will, were to put in a payment method, which makes it, which is just incredibly difficult to use, Although they may have the best intentions and it makes a lot of sense from like a psychological or a behavioral scientific perspective. So do I think it's necessarily a positive thing to have easier payment methods? No. Do I think we're going to deviate from that? Also no. So I think this is a development that we're just unfortunately stuck with. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that we can't deal with it. Buying things now is easy. 
that doesn't mean it has to be. Vandenacker says good old-fashioned methods, like putting away money in an envelope marked vacation, still work. And if you really wanted to take it to an extreme, there's nothing stopping you from paying off your credit card after every purchase. So you actually have to have the resources available if you can get yourself into the habit of immediately having to repay the credit card. This also means that the entire purchasing experience has become a bit of a hassle because it's no longer just one click. It's one click there and then you have to grab your phone and then you now have to log in to your credit card or your online banking app and you have to move money around. And then you, you're actually looking immediately at your, your financial circumstance and you're confronted with it again and again. Is this pleasant? No, but that's the point. Thanks for listening to The Best New Ideas in Money. You can subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please leave us a rating or review. And if you have ideas for future episodes, drop us a line at bestnewideasinmoney at marketwatch.com. Thanks to Carlton English, Marshall Lux, Merle Vandenacker, and Lauren Saunders. To learn more about Buy Now, Pay Later, head to marketwatch.com. I'm Stephanie Kelton. And I'm Charles Passy. The Best New Ideas in Money is a podcast from MarketWatch. The producers are Michael McDowell, Meta Lutzhoff, and Katie Ferguson. This episode was mixed by Megan Oftermat. Melissa Haggerty is executive producer. Jeremy Binks is our news editor, and Mark DeCambry edited this episode. The Best New Ideas in Money theme was composed by Sam Retzer. Stephanie Kelton is an economist and a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University, and not part of the MarketWatch newsroom. We'll be back next week with another new idea.